When you're designing a conference, one of the most important decisions you make is who's your anchor man, who's going to land the conference and wind it up on a high note. This year, though, that was an easy decision. Um, our colleague, Marshall Van Alstein, is writing the blockbuster book about one of the most important business transformations of our time, which I would describe as the move from the product to the platform. His book on the, he has literally co-written the book on the topic. It's called Platform Revolution. Uh, we are all uh, well advised to read it and learn from it. So to wind us up, let's have Marshall tell us a bit about platforms. Thanks very much. Well, I love Andy. Not only does he do great research, he's also a wonderful publicist. I'm not sure I can meet that bar, but thank you very much. So I really do want to see if I can convince you that there are changes in the economy and what some of those fundamental changes might be. I also want to draw a couple of connected dots between some of the things that Rene has done, uh, some of the things that Guillaume uh, mentioned about earlier, uh, and even one or two of the things that Mustafa talked about in terms of um, the big three, if you will. So I don't know. Let me ask you, this is a good audience for this, up until two years ago, what was the most famous company in the world? We had a bunch of branding folks. What was the most famous company in the world two years ago? Coca-Cola. Oh, excellent. A lot of you were drinking the one there. I was expecting, you know, I was going to give you a hint, it is a beverage company. I was expecting in Boston that this might be, you know, Sam Adams or Guinness here in the Irish area. Uh, we can do that afterwards. But yes, in fact, it was Coca-Cola up until two years ago. Um, I want to give you three facts. So many of you may have seen some of the platform work. So the first couple of slides might be familiar on a few of those points. I'm going to take it in a slightly new direction toward the end to try to convince you the shifts are quite fundamental in the economy. Well, this came from interbrand data. And the three, um, the most famous companies in the world are now Apple and Google. Apple actually correlates with the most valuable company in the world, which is quite interesting. Anyone know how Google and Apple passed Coca-Cola? And it was not by outspending them on marketing. How did they pass them? Any thoughts? I mean, it's interesting that your kids might even know, say, Google it, knowing what's happening. It became a verb. It's so much a part of your daily life, there's interactivity. If we look at the marketing, what's happening is you interact with the community so much, you don't need to do marketing. Google spends less on advertising globally and Coca-Cola spends domestically in the United States alone. It's quite remarkable how well they've achieved that. In fact, this chart shows, in fact, that the three fastest growing brands in terms of recognition are all platform companies. There's Amazon, Google, um, Apple. In fact, if we look at the data, 13 of the top 30 are platform companies. Um, for those of you who are interested in these topics, we're actually going to be fe featuring folks like uh, Nike or, or even Vivanda. Uh, Mike McCormick Spice, how they managed to convert a Spice company into a platform uh, at the MIT Platform Summit on July 10th. So I please do invite you to come back to that. It's not just technology companies, but it can be shoe or even Spice companies that are doing it. I define these platform companies, at least for purposes of this, as companies that have an external ecosystem. Do they have developers? Who else is adding value? Do they have partnerships that are adding value externally to the ecosystem um, outside the company? If you take a look at the technological footprint, the data are even more compelling than its platform companies. So if you simply look at the visits or the number of companies that are there, um, Facebook, Google, YouTube are the dominant companies overwhelmingly on the internet. And I really don't care where you go. If you go at Russia, it's platform companies. If you go look in China, it's Taobao, Alibaba, Baidu. Those are the dominant firms. If you look in Latin America, you see Orkut, again, also platform firms, Google uh, dominant in those areas. Or if you look at economic value, again, Mustafa talked about the big three. Well, in fact, if you look at the, rank the firms by market capitalization, three of the top five are now platform companies, Apple, Microsoft, and Google, moving in among the ranks and displacing finance and energy companies. This is quite remarkable. So whether we're looking at fame, or whether we're looking at internet presence, or whether we're looking at value creation, Platform companies, I argue, are becoming dominant firms, but there are other phenomena I want to highlight uh, in just a moment. Again, this is a trend that's been going on for more than a decade. It's happened since the turn of the century. If we take a look at the uh, inner firms ranked by market capitalization, the proportion of firms that has been a platform company has been growing uh, over time. It's quite remarkable how, what the data actually show uh, well, for more than a decade now. Part of the question is that the platform, the product business model is broken. Anyone willing to admit that they carry a BlackBerry anymore? 
I mean, it's almost the equivalent of the feature phone at this point, right? That you almost no one even will carry those. The, some of you will have seen the market share data on this. Um, in a mere four short years, from 2009 to 2013, they went from half the market here to only 2% of the market. A complete unraveling. Right? I often joke, well, you know, as management, that's hard to do. Right? You, you really don't want to be the management team in charge of that. The, the thing I mathematically wanted to draw your attention to was the convex unraveling. I'll argue in some sense that there are network effects at play or there is a <clears throat> an unwinding that's taking place. Um, this was the same thing that we observed in the 1980s and 90s. It's good to look at what Apple did in the 1980s and 90s. This is the market capitalization of Microsoft in blue relative to Apple in red. Apple was a closed product. It wasn't an ecosystem in the same way. They charged $10,000 for the system developer toolkits. By the time of the antitrust trial, Microsoft had six times the number of developers and six times, or more than six times the number of applications in there. Uh, they were flatlining. Uh, you know, in medical terms, the companies, the boss, um, you might call them as a dead patient. They're flatlining. Uh, Business Week even predicted that they were going to die uh, overall. It's true for a large number of different companies. I don't care where you start. Pick any of the famous companies that we looked at today. And if you look at the exponential growth, the curve, you might pick Etsy or Skype. Airbnb, Line, Uber. Each of these firms exhibits this characteristic pattern of this exponential growth, which I would argue is largely driven by these network effects. A network effect, again, is a demand economy of scale or value that's created for one user for another user. So here's a question for you. Why is it, in the absence of switching costs, Google has a 67% market share in the United States, 91% market share in Europe. Why is that? It's a data-driven feedback loop, also a network effect. Each time you search, they, Google observes your behavior, populates that back into the algorithm, improves the algorithm, attracts more people to it, and improves the algorithm again so that the search results are better. It's a better service. They are making it the case that each instance of the use of the service improves the use of the service for other users. Again, propagating that data value across the user population. It's a remarkable feedback loop that's uh, keeping them uh, atop of the uh, market share curves. So what is a platform? Think of a platform as an open architecture upon which third parties can build that other people will add value to the ecosystem. I want to think of it as an open architecture together with a governance model, the rules for managing the network effects. How is it you're going to internalize, or in some sense, for those of you who are economists, how would you manage the market failures? You need the governance model to cover the externality, to cover the information asymmetries, to cover the data-driven feedback loop. Who gets the value of that? The key point here is that products have features, platforms have communities. This is a, you know, thanks Andy, this is going to be the sell for the book. This is what it's supposed to be coming out, Platform Revolution. Uh, I've got a couple, two co-authors, Jeffrey Parker, longtime friend and colleague, um, and an in, <coughs> internet startup expert, Sangeet Chowdhury, uh, who'll be joining us uh, again on July, uh, July 10th for this. At any rate, it's the external communities that are creating this essential value. It's the interaction uh, that's taking place in the marketplace. So, this leads to some fairly fundamental differences. I'll ask you a question, so I'll make an observation. Consider that your product might have a network effect. There's a data-driven feedback, or there's a possible externality. In any market where this is possible, I'm gonna argue that the managerial techniques have to shift from paying attention to things inside the firm to outside the firm. Why? It's a really simple reason. You cannot scale network effects inside the firm the same way you can outside. There's simply more users outside. That means you're going to be able to scale differently. This has really big implications in terms of how you manage the organization because wealth is created outside the firm. I want to draw attention to, I love the uh, Guillaume's data talking about the industrial era versus the internet era. I actually think that we're able to try to draw some interesting parallels from the turn of the century with the industrial era and what happened at that time to what's happening now. If we take a look at the industrial era, what is it that was causing large firms? What gave us antitrust? Supply-side economies of scale, massive fixed costs, low marginal costs. We were two energy giants at the turn of the century, Edison and Westinghouse. They were two 
major automobile providers. It's a very high market concentration. Uh, Henry Ford and Alfred Sloan. You know, wonderfully, Alfred Sloan contributed to the MIT Sloan School, so we thank him very much uh, for that. Um, another instance of it, coal production and steel mining, uh, steel production. <coughs> There were only a handful of giant firms because of the massive supply-side economies of scale. There were one giant firm in Germany, one in England, uh, Carnegie still here in the United States. Or another one, the, the best one here is Vanderbilt, sometimes called the Colossus of Railroads. It's beautiful because he became rich and famous by being able to tax all of the tran com commercial transactions interstate going across his railroads. In the same way, the big internet providers can pr take a tax on the um, bits taking, uh, going across their ecosystems. It's quite remarkable how he was able to transform that. What's interesting is I would argue that we can take the same insights and look at the exact other side of the profit equation. Instead of the supply side, look at the demand side. Again, the economists call a network effect a demand side economy of scale. We can use this to explain the internet giants of today in juxtaposition to the industrial giants of yesterday. So who are the internet giants of today? Again, these are all driven by social networks or network effects or alternatively demand side economies of scale. That's how we get operating system monopolies. That's how we get giant firms in microblogging. You would be hard pressed to go create a new competing microblogging site at this point in time, again, due to the network effects. How about Alibaba? largest um, marketplace in the world. Extremely hard to go set up a, comp a competing ecosystem. In it. Or if we take a look at social networks, Facebook now has a larger um, population than that of China. It's incredible. But again, it's the other side of the profit equation. What's fascinating is we're about to enter a period of antitrust economics, analogous to but completely distinct from the antitrust economics we had to deal with in the industrial era. But I'm also going to argue what that does, by changing the focus of the attention from inside the firm to outside, because that's where the value is being created, most of the things we teach in business school are reconditioned. So if we take, for example, finance, we might have originally taught shareholder value. That has now been moved in the direction of stakeholder value. I don't know how many of you um, observed the debate that took place literally only June of last year, less than a year ago, between a finance professor at NYU and a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley trying to figure out the the value of Uber, right? The, the finance types did traditional discounted cash flow analysis, estimated the size of the market, gave them a value of 5.9 billion. He thought the venture caps are crazy. They're dropping 1.2 billion on a firm only making a few hundred million. It makes no sense at all. One of the venture cap capitalists, uh, Bill Gurley in Silicon Valley, said, no, 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 no. You're forgetting network effects. Uber riders attract Uber drivers, attract Uber riders, attract Uber drivers. That expands the market. We're going to move not just that from the taxi markets, but also into second car replacement markets, then into um, logistics markets. The market is bigger. They came up with a valuation of 17. Do you know what Uber's worth today? 46 billion, right? You have to account for the network effects, the, va the value creation outside the company, right? The finance traditional models didn't work. Um, in R&D, you might have had specialized R&D labs. You then move in the direction of open innovation, the crowdsource stuff, the kind of things that um, uh, George was just talking about. In strategy, what we're taught was building entry barriers, moats around the firm, or ha having inimitable resources and controlling those. That's not what happens in the long tail. Apple didn't build Angry Birds, and Facebook didn't build uh, Farmville or Mafia Wars. You open the ecosystem so that folks bring you the, the inimitable resources, and you have them in your orbit. You have them in your ecosystem. Again, strategic options are going to change. You bring in engagement and capture that long tail. Or if we take a look at marketing, we just heard we move from push, um, push marketing, broadcast, and, in, and um, outbound to pull marketing and inbound. We've almost completely flipped the paradigm in the marketing uh, dimension. I love the IT space. It started with information technology as back office systems, and we built SAP. Then it moved to front office systems, and then we got CRM, customer relationship manager. Now the next stage is actually out of office systems, right? Then we're doing social networks. We're doing social and mobile and analytics and cloud outside the firm. So again, there's this progression to creating value outside the ecosystem. And what about operations and logistics? 
There was a wonderful line that was going across uh, Silicon Valley. Uber, the largest taxi company in the world, owns no taxis. Airbnb, the largest hotel company in the world, doesn't own any real estate. Facebook, the largest content firm in the world, doesn't produce any content. And Alibaba, the largest merchant in the world, doesn't own any damned inventory. That's incredible. We've gone from just-in-time inventory to not even mine inventory. I'm selling other people's stuff. It's unbelievable how the transition from management of internal resources to the focus of the firm to external resources, the creation of value outside the firm, changes a lot of the traditional management practices that we have today. So with that, I'm happy to field any questions. We've been um, even shy, short on time. So we might have a minute or two in case any of you have any thoughts on this or next generation of research. There are several additional lines of research that we plan on conducting through the um, uh, initial on the digital economy. Uh, one of them is going to be on fraud prevention. How do you take these, in, these big ecosystems and actually you turn them in to see if you can actually eliminate corruption uh, in larger systems? What are the proper governance models? Others will be the division of proper value creation. If the ecosystem is creating all the value, how do you divide that properly among the ecosystem memberships? Another one might be, what is the economic value of APIs? How do we measure that? Um, you know, patents used to be an interesting form of intellectual property. We now have new forms of intellectual property in the form of uh, APIs and others that will have very interesting economics. So very happy to invite you to participate uh, in any of those activities. So with that, at least let me know if there are any other questions or let me not separate you from the wine and the beer uh, coming afterwards. Mm. Thanks very much, Marshall. Okay. That was uh, terrific. Uh, we're looking forward to. Oh, you got a question here? Okay. We don't leave yet. Uh, we're we're twenty pages away from done. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, and I couldn't agree more. I think you remember ages ago, I think Sabre was more valuable than American Airlines. You know, the, the, the marketplace that they were creating, in some sense, was more valuable than the service of flying planes. Um, I don't know if you still have that slide deck up. There's a hidden slide I could actually show you where I think there are one or two additional ideas along that dimension. So if you can go back to the, the slide deck we just had. Um, there's a hidden slide that shows a chain of how I think some of the industries are going to evolve. Um, again, this was just some kind of backup. Go to the very, the very back end. There's a, there's a slide that you can actually see a chain, but the problem is it's hidden. You're going to have to select it. So if you just go to the end. Um, Do you so know the number, maybe? Yeah, it's going to be, so it's going to be like slide 18 or 19. Let's go, go on, one more. OK, no, no, past that. But, it, but it's hidden. Yeah. So it's, yeah. You know, slide. sometimes you have subboard and principle. The, the okay. key principle here is I'm arguing that the rate of change of different industries is a function of the proportion of value created by external communities um, or by information. So a heavy industry is going to have more of its value from capital assets rather than from external assets, so it'll transition later. Uh, or regulated industries. So we have to might HIPAA requirements in healthcare. Could be great platforms. We have to deal with the regulation in there. Or the complexity of the different issues that must be addressed in a huge supply chain, uh, that may transition uh, a little bit later. But we have instances in almost all these major industries. You could even take heavy industries like mining, for example. Uh, I know many of you have heard the gold core story on, on those kinds of things. Um, no, you've, you know, it's, it's not that. <laughs> yeah. So 
you know, it, you would think that mining would be one where you wouldn't be able to do anything. So Gold Core is a story of a Red Lake mine had been 50 years old. The mine seemed to be tapped out. No one was getting any value out of it. He, he came to MIT. The CEO came to MIT. He heard a story about Linux and opening the system. He threw open their data 50 years worth to open innovation. The community was able to develop new visual models of where the ore, the ore deposits were. They're also able to develop um, uh, techniques for identifying soil samples, other things that they'd never, so they got even new techniques and they identified 50% new mines that they'd never even seen before. Uh, still not the right slide. <laughs> um, look, look at, there's a long chain that gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so it's, there's a red bar across the type, then um, blue, and then a bunch of little green bubbles underneath. So it's, it's that one. I know it's, I know it's there. <laughs> the point was they increased the number of mines they had never there heard of by, that's it, right. Information technology and services and consumer goods, heavy industry, as you move to the right, they're more protected by credentialing regulation of hard assets, but we see platforms in every one of these industries. So um, thermostats and nests for home goods, uh, riders and Ubers and cars. Um, go, go one slide further. So even we're going to see, so this is exactly right, go one, go one slide further. Um, even governments are going to transform. Smart grids and energy and utility, even mines are going to be transformed uh, in there. The, even heavy asset companies can do it. To the extent that you can add information as value, you can add community as value, those industries will also transform. Well, thanks very much, Marshall. Thank you. So you've had a little taste of the MIT uh, fire hose today, a flood of uh, information and insight. And not just from all the, the smart, big brains here on the stage, but uh, all of you contributed. And as uh, George hinted, a lot of people outside the room as well, and whether it's in the, uh, the classrooms or in your companies. And that's in large part because uh, doing great, interesting research depends very much, we think, on asking interesting questions, asking the right questions. And we depend very much on you to help guide us for that. So thank you very much for that. Um, I also want to make sure we, get, we have a shout out thank to the, the team at Via Lago that provided the food, the team at uh, Amps Video for the video, the MIT uh, AV team uh, juggling slides uh, uh, impromptu from uh, some of the speakers. Um, and I want to thank uh, a small army that uh, helped em uh, organize all the logistics for this. And the emphasis really has to be on small because it's, it's hardly any people. There's uh, Justin Lockenwitz and uh, Tammy Bazell and uh, Susan Young. In fact, uh, of those three, Susan is the only one who's here right now. So it's literally an army of one there. So thank you very much, Susan. She's in the back of the room. If you knew how much uh, the IDE depends on her, and me in particular, you would be amazed. Uh, we depend quite heavily on that. Um, I want to let you know that uh, next up is some uh, wine and beer, as, as Marshall hinted, uh, a lot, as well as a poster session, more knowledge, our famous poster sessions. We've got eight posters that go in more depth for some ad additional uh, uh, research projects that we're doing. Uh, five of those, you should know, uh, came directly out of the uh, analytics lab that Sinan and I are teaching and that, that Chuck and Susan and, and others are, are helping with. And many of your companies are, are involved in uh, supporting with uh, data and challenging us with the right questions on those as well. So you get to see those. And uh, last but not least, there are some uh, party gift, parting gifts for you if you want to pick those up on the way out. We hope to see you all back soon. Uh, the next thing on our agenda is, in fact, the uh, platform conference. Uh, we can hear more from uh, Marshall. And by then, I think he'll have the last 20 pages done. So I, we're all waiting to see how that story ends. Um, and that's on, Ju on June, or is it July 10th? Is it June or Ju July 10th? Yes, July 10th. Um, so we'll see you there. And it's going to be right here uh, at the Media Lab uh, part of MIT. And you can, of course, keep up to date on our website, at the IDE website. So thank you all. It's been a real pleasure interacting with you. And we look forward to continuing to uh, build this research with you all. Thanks. <laughs>